promises of God. As we think about standing on the promises of God, you know, we look around us and you know, we understand from our knowledge of the scriptures how many promises have been made to mankind by God. And if we turn to 2 Peter, 2 Peter starting at chapter 1 and verse 1, we'll read those first four verses. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We have those great promises, those great promises of God, and especially in this day and age, we need to stand on those promises of God. We really need to make that our foothold. We need to make that the firm foundation that we stand upon as we go into this new month of November, as we approach what is surely to be in the next week. No matter how things happen, it's going to be a contentious time in our society. And through all of those things, we can allow ourselves to be riled up in the in, in the hubbub of of the political uh, realm of things that seems to be overtaking our lives. And every time we turn on the television, every time we log on to our social network sites that we may frequent, we are bombarded with such hopeless drivel out there in the world. And no matter where uh, someone's political alliances fall, we need to be sure that we, as those in the household of faith, are standing on those promises of God. And more than that, that we share those promises with others. Because they can lay hold of those promises as well. They can have that hope of heaven after a while. They can weather the storms of life. You know, one of the things that I've learned in, in looking at social media, you know, it, it is a it's a dangerous thing because it can be helpful. It's wonderful. We talked this morning in the meeting we had before services, uh, the, the men, as we met together about how the reach of you know our Thursday night Bible study and when we post these recorded sermons on onto YouTube and and Facebook, how the reach goes much further than just this group that is is here and how promising that is and how how nice it is to know that there are others that are seeking to know the truth and and how valuable that can be uh, for us uh, to to continue. But as we look around in in social media and if you talk to people, you see that there's that hopelessness. We've talked about it before. I saw someone, one of my friends this week, saying that they were doing things this week to kind of alleviate their fear and their stress of what's going to come about in the next few days, whatever it may be. And uh, realizing that they they don't have hope, realizing that they uh, are so torn asunder by the, the words and the happenings that are going on in this world, but there's much more than that. We have the promises of God that we can stand firmly on. Let's look at what a promise is. Now, Webster defines it as a declaration that one will do or refrain from doing something. It's, it's that uh, statement that, yes, I'm going to do this. We do that in our daily lives, a promissory note. Now, most of us probably have a promissory note of some kind filed away in a bank Uh, filing cabinet somewhere. Uh, For me, there's one filed away somewhere saying that I'm going to, Angela and I are going to pay back the money we borrowed to buy our home. 
And uh, there is with that promissory note, signed so many years ago, it says that if we don't, there's going to be a consequence. There's that promise that was made. We, have, we enter into contracts, you know, even if we have work done uh, for with, a, with a construction contractor. We enter into a contract saying, okay, you're going to do this, and I'm going to pay you this much, or I'll hold up my end of the bargain by doing this. We have contracts. Those are things that we're used to. We make vows. The most popular in society would be a vow of marriage, saying that you're going to uh, love, honor, and cherish that one that, uh, that you've chosen to marry. Promises are important in everybody's lives. They kind of hold things together. We can see that in our in our society, in our financial system, it's all based upon promises. It's, uh, you know, we, we, when we go out into the world, we are expecting that, you know, when the mechanic promises that he's going to fix our car, we're, we're trusting that he's going to do just that. Promises are important in everybody's lives, but they're especially important in the lives of a Christian because we have promises that take us so much further than than just what we're going to do or, uh, you know, something of an earthly nature. You know, promises, the promises of God are extremely important to a, to a Christian. And therefore, extended out, they can be very important in the lives of every single person we come into contact with. If they understand those promises and the sturdiness of them, the unwavering uh, state of them, they too can plant their feet firmly on those promises and they can be held up above all the things that take us down in this world. When we're looking at standing on the promises of God, we first, today, we want to talk about the character of the promiser. I'm not sure if promiser is a word. It doesn't sound right to me, but we're going to use it today. The, the, the promiser, the one making the promise. We want to look at the value of the promises that have been made, and we want to look at the nature of those promises as we go through today thinking about these promises of God that we stand so firmly on. When we think of the character of the promiser, you know, think about, think about someone that may have promised you something, and have you ever been disappointed by someone that promised you something? Did someone promise to do something for you or, or give you something and then they backed out? They backed out at the last minute. I know it's happened to me in my life and unfortunately uh, in times gone by I've done that to people. And I think every one of us, every one of us can uh, think back to a time where we reneged on a, on a promise. And uh, no, matter, no matter the case, it's not a good thing. We should, we should strive to do better than that. But think about the disappointment that maybe you have felt when a promise was broken to you. We've been disappointed. That's not the case with God. We are not going to be disappointed. Promises of men are broken every day. Mankind can be unpredictable. One day we can promise one thing, but then the winds change, the tide changes, and it becomes more expedient for us to do things this way. And so maybe we say, well, I've changed my mind. I'm not going to do that. Mankind is predictable like that. Marriage vows are unfortunately broken so many times. It's, I don't have the statistic in front of me. Wish I'd remembered when I was preparing this slide, I'd have looked it up. But uh, the, from my memory, the, the number of marriages that take place uh, and then end within three to five years is something like 40%. It's approaching the halfway mark. It's, it's, in that, it's in that area. Whatever the number is, it's a lot. It's a lot more than it should be. I've even heard someone, I've heard someone with my own ears say on someone's wedding day or approaching their wedding uh, that, you know, well, he's a really good catch. He's a good first husband, making the assumption that there will be a second or a third or a fourth or, or whatever it may be. 
Can you imagine that? Can you imagine having that kind of a mindset going into going into something as serious as marriage vows? Something instituted by by God. And that and that's where people lose lose track of of how important those vows are. Financial contracts are broken every day. Those contracts come and go. They they kind of blow around like the wind. We we understand those things to, to take place every day of our lives. We're reminded in Scripture, though, to let our yes be yes and our no be no. Matthew 5, verse 37. But let your yes be yes and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Now, this is a Scripture that goes back some, some years with me. And uh, uh, when I was younger, I, I certainly was. Uh, you know, of that mindset that, well, I'll, yeah, sure, I'll do that. But then when that day came, if there was something better to do that suited my liking better, I would say, oh, well, you know, never mind, I'm not going to do that. And someone, a uh, godly person in my life, reminded me of this scripture. But let your yes be yes and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. And as I thought about that back then, not fully understanding very much about the scriptures, not understanding the truth of the gospel, you know, I looked at that and thought, well, I'm not evil. You know, I'm, not, I'm not out there trying to do evil things. But the simple truth is when we do more than a yes or a no, if we don't stick to our promises, then... Uh, this is something that is from the evil one. This is something that will drag us down. This is something that will that will put us in a position where we can't be trusted by those around us, where we will go through our lives without the character building uh, experiences of sticking to something. Sometimes things get hard. <clears throat> you know, I remember going with the Boy Scouts out west to New Mexico, and. They drop you out in the middle of the of nowhere, and you hike 80 miles or so back to the base camp. And I remember some of those days where you're hiking with an 80-pound pack on your back, and you're getting up high in the mountains. The air is getting thinner, and it's difficult. And you want to turn around and go back. You just want to fall down and quit. But there's something to be said for having put one foot in front of the other to finish what you started. Uh, and we can we can see that and relate to that in many cases in our lives, whether it's something as simple as a task at hand. Finishing that task is a wonderful thing. It brings a good feeling to you. But we need to, more than that, realize that if we turn back on those things that we promise, it's not a uh, it's, it, it, it's not a good thing, especially for those of the household of faith. And as we think about the character again of the promiser, in the case of the promises of God, we have something better. Fortunately, God is God, and he's not us, because we can be unpredictable. We can be those that turn back on our promises, but God is not going to do that. And we realize that God does not change. Malachi 3 at verse 6, there at the beginning, says, For I, the Lord, do not change. That is a truth. That is a promise of the Lord that you can take to the bank, that you can stand firmly on. God does not change. He is faithful. In Hebrews 10 at verse 23, we read, Let's hold firmly to the confession of our hope, without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. We know that when we obey the gospel of Christ, we know that when we, when we do those things that are according to the will of the Lord, that he is faithful to bring us to where he has promised. He is faithful to uphold all of those promises that he has made to his people. Abraham trusted God's promise is we realize his belief was credited to him as righteousness. You know, Abraham was told that you're going to have a son. And 
he, he sort of laughed at that. He sort of thought, at my age, how is that going to take place? But we understand reading in Romans 4, uh, Romans 4 verse 3, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. He didn't waver in his in, in unbelief. He believed that God was going to do what he said he did. He didn't understand how, but he believed. And that's one of the things that we really should think about in our everyday lives. We don't know how God upholds all of these promises. We don't know how all of the inner workings of, of his being work amongst us. But we know that he's going to do what he said he's going to do. In Romans 4, uh, uh, just a little further, verses 20 and 21, we read, Let, Yet with respect to the promises, promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised he was able also to perform. Let us never forget that God is able. We have the best promiser that could ever be. We know that God is not going to fail. He never has failed. Later on, as we come closer to the end of this lesson, we'll, we'll look at some of the promises that are made to all mankind versus those that, that are made to those in his church. But regardless, those promises stand. When, when God makes a promise, he follows through with it. We want to, again, as we think about the promises of God, we want to think of the value of the promises. You know, how, how much are they worth? We're told there in, in first, Second Peter 1 that they're exceedingly great and precious promises. Again, reading verse 4 of Second Peter 1, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. You know, the lust of mankind takes us in all kinds of directions. It takes us after such things that can only, it boggles the imagination to think of all the things that we can get ourselves tangled up in. And, when we focus on the promises of God, understanding that they're so great and they're so precious, and I, and I think that even amongst the brethren sometimes we forget just how precious those promises are. When we follow through, when we follow through with obedience to the Lord, we can be those partakers of this divine nature. We can escape the corruption that we see around us. You know, we see... You know, turn on the television, we see corruption everywhere. We hear, we hear it spoken of, and it seems like every time you turn around, there's a corrupt official somewhere in, in some branch of some public office. And we hear nothing, we hear all about it. It comes out and there's corruption everywhere. The only way to escape the corruption of this world is through Christ, through those promises that have been promised to his people. Are you one of his people today? That's one of the things that we want to bring to your mind and have you think about as we go through this lesson. These promises of God are great because simply they come from God. We already talked about the promiser and how steadfast the promiser is. They're great because they come from him. How, how much better could they become? <clears throat> they involve our most valuable possession these promises and I, I don't know i struggle with that with the wording i sat there last night thinking about you know the, the most valuable possession our soul because do we really you know god gave us our soul god gave us uh, created us and gave us the breath that we have and he's given us that free will in a way we have that possession of our soul for this time but make no mistake that god is still going to follow through with his promise, and those that don't follow him are going to find themselves in a place of eternal torment. These promises of God, these unshakable promises of God, involve our soul, and we need to think seriously about that. Matthew 16, verse 26, as we have listed there on the screen, 
says, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Now think about the famous people that you may have heard about in the world today that have seemingly all the money in the world. I've heard not more than a few, or more than a few, I've heard several as they come close to the end of their life, sitting amongst all of their riches and their wealth, talk about the things that they wish they had done. You know, they talk about the, the fulfilling things that they've done in their lives, but there's still that emptiness there. There's still that emptiness that they're grasping for. You know, no matter the value of our bank accounts, no matter the value of our possessions, what does it really mean in the end? When we take our last breath, what do all of those things really mean? Look at the Egyptian pyramids that were packed full of valuable physical possessions to be used in that afterlife that they looked so forward to. And it's still there. Well, some of it's been robbed out of the tombs, but those things are just still around. Those things are still around and they are... Uh, they're rotting away here on this earth. They are, not, um, they are not in the afterlife with those people as they had, in, they had intended. And there's one thing that is sure, is they are now in the Hadean realm. They're thinking about those things that they put at the top of their list as far as valuable possessions. Our soul is the most valuable thing that we have charge over in our lives. We need to be sure that we are setting ourselves up in such a way that the Lord will find us to be faithful. These promises that are great, that come from God, they never fail. Again, 2 Peter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That pro those promises of eternal life, they're for all men. They are for every person on this earth. And the Lord is willing and hopes that every person would come to that knowledge of the truth, that they would come to repentance. It's our job to share the value of those promises. It's our job to instill in other people's minds through the word of God that <clears throat> there is a valuable promise waiting for them. 1 John 2, starting at verse 24, says, Therefore let, let, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. The most valuable promise out there, the most valuable thing that we can, that we can long for is that eternal life. And when you think about our daily lives, what are the things that we long for? Right about now or very soon, some of us, our, our tummies will start to grumble and we'll start to long for lunch. We'll start to long for other things, you know, out in the world. But, but beyond that, but beyond that, realize that eternal life is worth more than all those things. Eternal life is worth more. That promise is worth more than can ever be stated. When we, again, think about these promises of God, we want to think about the nature of them. We want to think about what they really are. They're specific. For example, some things have not been promised. You hear in the religious world today about it, so many things that, that, that uh, people cook up in their, in their doctrines. And they say that the Lord has promised these certain things, but when you look into the scriptures, you see that they're not promised. You know, one of the things is that there's another chance after death. Now, Hebrews 9.27 reminds us, and it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. But some will tell you that after this death, you'll have a chance to atone yourself. There are some that will even pray for that person that died, trying to pray them into heaven. And uh, hoping, beyond hope, that 
that that will that that will work. And in many in, in all these cases, uh, people have been lied to, told that they'll have another chance. Live the live life the way you want now. Don't worry about these promises. Don't worry about obedience. Just love the Lord, and then afterwards you can you you can you can fix that. You know, one, one one such thing that comes to mind is the the idea of reincarnation that you'll come back in different forms until you're perfected until until you're ready to obtain that reward of eternal life and we know that that's a lie of the devil there is no other chance after death as we read there in Hebrews 9 it's appointed for men to die once but after this the judgment Another thing that isn't promised is another breath. You know, men make all sorts of plans. James 4.14 says, Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. We don't know that we'll have the next breath that we expect to take in just a few seconds. We are not promised such a thing. You know, um, if you've ever... If you've ever fallen ill, if you've ever fallen ill, I know sometimes, I can remember times in the past where one moment I felt fine and the next minute I felt horrible. And things can happen so quickly. I, I've, uh, I've known of people that, that passed away just as abruptly, that were walking around and, just, and fine and then, and then fell over dead. We are not promised another breath. So we should not get so comfortable in the fact that we've been taking so many breaths thus far in our lives. We should not take for granted that the next one might not come. Another thing is that salvation out of Christ and his church. That's one thing that is promised to many people. Look around us in the world today and see how many quote-unquote churches there are out there. And how many of your friends and neighbors put their faith and their hope in such teachings that they can have salvation no matter where they choose to worship. Now, one of the most dangerous statements out there in the world that is said so many times and is well-meaning is worship at the church of your choice, as if there was more than one. Salvation outside of Christ and his church is impossible. There is no other way. There is one way to eternal life. Acts 2 of verse 47 indicates this. This is speaking of, of course, the day of Pentecost, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. The Lord added them. He added them to the church. He didn't say he added them to the church they chose. He didn't say he added them over here with this denomination. He added him to the church, those who were being saved. And then in the breadth of the rest of the scriptures, we understand what being saved means, and we understand what one must do in order to be saved. A little bit later in Acts, Acts 8, the Ethiopian eunuch tells us, indicates what must be done in order to be saved. And there is a good example just a few chapters later. Matthew 16 at verse 18 says, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Death has no power against the Lord. Death has no power against Christ. It's important that we remember that. We remember that it is his church that we want to be in. It's important that we open our, our Bibles and we recognize whether or not we are in his church, whether we can expect to be standing on those promises of God, or if we're just following our own lusts. Another thing that is not promised in the scriptures is an easy life. Second Timothy 3 at verse 12 says, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. When you turn on the television and you listen to some of those that claim to be those that are bringing forth the word of God and they tell you that prosperity is just around the corner, 
They tell you that if you send in a little bit of money to them, that you'll be returned so much more money and that all of your troubles will go away. All of your aches and pains and ailments will go away. That's not promised in the scriptures. When you look at the, at the apostles and look at, look at the, the, the trouble that they went through, you look at the heartaches and the trouble of, of Christ, how can we expect to have an easy life when, in, in reference to what we read in the scriptures? We know that our treasure is laid up in heaven. We know that we're hoping for that, that heaven after a while, that comfort that will come. The nature of God's promises is that they are specific. They don't include all of these things that we hear from mankind. The promises of God, again, though, never fail. This is something that is worth repeating a hundred times to put it into our minds that the promises of God never fail. Numbers 23 at verse 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? We understand that God is able. God will follow through on his promises. We can be sure of that. When we look again at the nature, or continuing to look a little bit at the nature of God's promises, we come to realize that there are some promises that are unconditional. You know, seed time and harvest, for instance, are promised. And we can see that has played out. No matter what people tell us in the news, every year we have seed time and we have harvest. It has been promised to us and it, it happens every year. We can expect as the calendar changes, as we stand here uh, on the cusp of November, look out the window, there's leaves on the ground. We realize that that happens every year. Year. Matthew 5 of verse 45 says that you may be sons of your father in heaven for he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. There are some blessings that every man can take hold of, that every man can take hold of regardless, that they're just going to happen. The nature, the creation around us, as long as God desires, those things will come to be. The second coming of Christ is going to happen, whether, whether mankind wants it to or not. Acts 1, verses 10 and 11, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. We know that he will come back. We know that that's unconditional. It's going to happen on his terms, whether mankind wants it to or not. Our job is to ask, are we ready? The resurrection is going to happen. In Romans 5, verses 28 and 29. The judgment is going to happen, whether we like it or not whether we've prepared or not, whether we truly believe it's going to happen or not, it is not dependent upon mankind. Romans 14, starting at verse 11, says, For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God, so that each of us shall give account of himself to God. Now those are the unconditional promises that we have that no matter what, we, they're going to happen. The conditional promises, however, those are as follows. The remission of sins. In Acts 2, verse 38, we understand Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you repent and you are baptized, understanding who Christ is, being baptized in his name for the remission of sins, that's when, that's when that salvation takes place. That's when the forgiveness of sin takes place. 
answered prayers in 1 John 3 at verse 22. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Why would we expect to have any, to have any sway, to have our prayer heard and answered when we have nothing to do with the Lord at every other moment of our lives? You know, there's a, there's a particular country song that has bothered me for years, and I know maybe I'm overthinking it, but it involves this young person and in and, 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 and split moment, they, they fall into a precarious situation and then the song, the person asks for Jesus to take over. At that time when, when things became tough, but prior to that, there's nothing, no, no thought of godly things. There's no thought of looking into the scriptures to understand the will of the Lord. So if we expect prayers to be answered, we need to be those that are living according to the will of the Lord. John 5 and verse 14. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. You know, why would, why would we expect the Lord to just give us something that was sinful, to allow us to uh, do something and, pro and provide for us something that was detrimental to our soul? That's just not going to happen going to answer those prayers that are according to his will that's the condition spiritual blessings in Ephesians 1 at verse 3 blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ we need to be in Christ to receive those spiritual blessings it's important that we understand that. Important that we understand those promises. You know, people will look at this and believe that they're just going to receive spiritual blessings willy-nilly. But we need to be those that obey him. We realize that if we are going to experience those blessings, we need to be in Christ. And those of us that are of the household of faith, those of us that are in Christ, is the more we live, the more we understand, the more we seek after the will of the Lord, we understand those blessings that have been given to us. We understand the ways in which our lives have been blessed by the Lord. As we think a little bit more, coming to the end of this lesson, thinking about the promise of salvation. Again, Hebrews 5 and verse 9, and having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. And then in Matthew 7, at verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. It's important that we continually think about that, the will of the Father. Have we been acting in such a way that we can expect to be able to stand on those promises of God? Are we standing on those promises of God above all of the turmoil and all of the things that would drag us down in this life? As we've looked at the promises of God, as we've thought about standing on the promises of God today, we talked about the character of the promiser, and we realized that there is no better person that we can trust. God is able, and he will keep his promises. We've looked at the value of the promises, and especially in regards to our salvation. What, of what more value could a promise be? What, what more could we ask for than to have that everlasting life, to be with God in heaven forever? The nature of the promises. We've looked at the nature of the promises and looked at, at how some promises are not promised to everybody, those outside of the household of faith, understanding both, but everybody can take advantage of those promises. Everyone can stand on those promises through obedience. Not, not because their obedience is earning it, but because that free gift is given with that condition. If you're obedient to me, 
if you're obedient to my will, then I will give you everlasting life. We've looked at these aspects of the promises of God. We've looked at, at, at how important they are. We've looked at what they look like. Promises are important in the lives of Christians. They're important for every person. We need to be sure that we are standing on the promises of God. If you're here today and you realize that your life has been spent in such a way that it has not been according to the will of the Lord, if you're not sure, then we would love to study with you. We would love to open up the scriptures with you and Seek out those things that are according to the Lord's will. And see, if, see, see if we can be of assistance to you to take a look at your life and see if you've been standing on the promises of God. We understand that the word of God is able and we're told that in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's the first step for everybody. Then after we hear and we understand, we believe that he is who he says he is. We understand that this is something worth, worth following. We repent and turn away from our sins having a new purpose in our lives because why would we want to go back to those old ways? Why would we want to give up those promises of God that are promised to his church? We confess Christ before men not being ashamed of him because why would we be? Why would we be ashamed to be following the most faithful promiser ever? And then because of our understanding, because the scriptures tell us what we must do to be saved, we are baptized for the remission of sins, buried in the waters of baptism, where we contact that saving blood of Christ. We do that just like Abraham did, understanding that that promise is going to be fulfilled if I hold up my end of the bargain. If, if I am faithful and if I am obedient to the will of the Lord, just as he was, Abraham was, then I can lay hold of that promise. I can stand firmly above all of the things that would drag me down in this world, and I can live out the rest of my days in comfort and peace that surpasses all understanding, because I know that I've done what the scriptures say must be done in order to be saved. And then after that, each one of us needs to continually, every day when we get up in the morning and put our feet on the floor. When we lay down at night to close our eyes, we need to ask ourselves if we've been faithful. Revelation 2.10 reminds us that we must be faithful until death. So I ask you today, are you subject to the invitation of Christ? Do you need to put on Christ? Do you need to put on Christ so that you can stand on those promises of God and be faithful until death? Do you need the prayers of the saints? Have you been dragged down by the world and just need the support of one another in this family that we have here? And by all means, if you're subject to the invitation, come forward as we stand and we sing.